delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you on camera about your uh, impressive body of work. And as a geropsychologist, I know you've had an enduring uh, interest uh, as a scholar and a researcher mm -hmm. in personality disorders and how people living with personality disorders um, shift, if you will. Mm -hmm. Can we start with just a simple description of what a personality disorder is? Sure. I, maybe it would be helpful for, to articulate how I started in it because that really gives a good description of it. Very good. So I did, uh, and I was privileged to get an NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, a postdoc, and for two years. And the second year, first year was clinical, the second year was research, and those of us who were postdocs had to um, pick a topic to do research in. I didn't know what I was going to do. And, um, but something fascinated me, and that was there, there were these kind of patients at, um, I was at Mass Mental Health Center, who really made um, these very uh, refined and experienced clinicians act wild, that they got very stimulated by them and very excited by them, and there was a lot of uh, back and forth conversation. And I would ask my mentor, who are these people? I can't get a handle on why that person, that patient, and not another patient would evoke such passion in, in these uh, clinicians. And he explained to me that these were people, they didn't call them personality disorders, but were at that point, they, that had characterological problems, that these were people who, just at the sense of themselves, um, had trouble in the world, and they especially had trouble with personal relationships, even most especially with intimate relationships. And um, that was something that started pretty early in life, certainly young adulthood or young, yeah, young adulthood, and we would see them even in older age. So without a name for him, without really understanding, um, he explained this to me, and that is as good as it gets for a personality disorder. These are people who are difficult. These are people who are described as impossible. These are people who are described as miserable. There's all sorts of things. And the experience that these people have is one of pain and frustration and an inability to see that in a way that they can change it. I've really looked at this from the individual all the way through now with going forward with my travels to global because these difficult, impossible, hurting people are all over the world. So as a clinician myself, I certainly know what it's like to sit with an individual at age 30 who's uh, both puzzled and unhappy about their interpersonal world. And what is the trajectory? What does this person potentially look like at 70? Some look better. Some who are very, very impaired have a curtailed life. I mean, there is a self-selection of people who actually make it to 70 or 80 or, or beyond. Um, and mostly people look pretty much the same. If they're functioning okay-ish in the world, they can work, they maybe can have a family and have some friends. Um, there are things in their midlife that bind or curtail the, the expression of the pathology. So what do I mean? Um, a person, for example, um, who is very much needful of adulation and uh, feedback from everyone that he or she is the best or grand or could get himself or herself into a professional position or work position where there are people who will give that kind of feedback. Then the person retires. Now you have the dominant personality traits which are adaptive in one milieu. He was running a department or she was running a department, but now is home. Oftentimes you see an exacerbation of the distress, the misery, the impossibleness. And I have stories of a man who retired who decided um, after 40 years his wife was, um, was stocking her cabinets wrong 
and so decided to do it with his way, which was alphabetically, which if you run a kitchen, you realize that makes no sense at all. But he was going to take control of that as he had taken control of that. So that's a kind of sweet little example. Sometimes it's not such a sweet example. So you ask how it morphs or how it changes. Part of it is the dominant traits, if they're maladaptive in, uh, adaptive in one milieu may be uh, maladaptive in another because of roles or relationships that serve to contain or buffer a way for, for their expression. Also, older adults, you, you know this from just uh, your own friends and family, go through multiple venues. Um, it used to be that you just stayed in the same place, or maybe if you retired, went to Florida, but really, basically. But now people live at home, they go to the hospital, they go to rehab for the knee or the hip. Uh, they go back home. Then they find they needed assisted living back in the hospital a couple of times for this, that, uh, another trip to rehab, ultimately to a skilled nursing facility. There's no data of which I'm aware, but I, I would love to see it. It's somewhere probably I would guesstimate between 6 and 11 different moves for the average person. You, go, you take your personality with you. So you have the juxtaposition of the personality whole in the context of care. And that's the other area that I've been interested in, in looking at. So this moves us to the opportunity to talk about your scholarship and research as a Fulbright grantee. I want to uh, do a quick uh, brag uh, for William James College and for you that we have had the honor of hosting a Fulbright scholar. Uh, from uh, the United Kingdom, but you are our star Fulbright grantee, mm -hmm. and you're about to go to China for your third Fulbright. Yes, I've been invited by Fudan University for the College of Nursing. I think the first clinician to do a global mental health as opposed to from research, but looking at it, and so hopefully there'll be other people who will, will continue, continue talking about, so what do you do with them? as opposed to just studying. In our conversation about five minutes ago, you talked about the geropsychologist and the role of consulting to care mm -hmm. settings. Sure. How frequently would someone who's struggling as a newly retired 72-year-old say, it may be a good idea for me to once again seek individual mental health or family mental health uh, consultation? I think it's going to change because of, of your word, word stand again. Um, the past cohort of older adults were not high utilizers of psychotherapy. Yes. And certainly my grandmother wouldn't have known what this was all about. As far as coming into it de novo as an older adult, that's usually out of either real and pain and clinical condition like a depression or a debilitating anxiety, or at somebody else's saying, can't stand this anymore, we're going or you're going, or a physician uh, and, and the Physicians now are a little more inclined to give a uh, to, to give the encouragement to their patients to to seek mental health. I think that people, are, the ones we're training now, um, who want to do direct psychotherapy, will and have specialization or at least an emphasis in Gero, uh, will be highly. I, I don't think a week goes by that I'm not asked if I can give referrals for someone uh -huh. to do that. Good for individuals and couples. For personality disorders, circle back, Please. very few will come and say, my personality has given me problems and I need some help, doctor, can you help me? Um, but when I retire, if I retire, there's a book that I'm going to write and it's going to be called, Yes, But You Don't Know My Mother. You had mentioned to me that in longitudinal studies about aging, the focus tends to be on the individual experience and not on the couple experience. Mm -hmm. Would love to hear your thoughts about that for a, a moment or two. Sure. And I would like then to conclude with talking a bit about if you are a graduate student in one of the mental health fields, including psychology and counseling, mm -hmm. what are the opportunities um, in the field? Long partnered, long married couples, um, same sex or heterosexual couples. The challenges are your own aging individually, plus your uh, and if they're more consonant, that's a better deal. It's when you get real differential aging, and real differential internalized scripts about what your aging is going to look like, 
then you have some issues. So, in not without great pathology, it does help to come in and talk to someone. And there's also on retirement it is a lot of um, okay, now what? Yeah, you look at each other and what are the hopes, dreams we have now? Yes, we re- met them all. Yes, and then of course uh, caregiving, uh, caregiving marriage, and going into that is. Uh, Yes. I'd say probably a big chunk of what you do with Trouble's work and then be done. You have founded and directed our concentration in mm-hmm. uh, geropsychology for yeah. a number of years. Yeah. And when a student is exploring this area, what might they look to? What kind of career might they build? Gerotechnology is a big field and they have their own um, scientific meetings and etc. So somebody who's into uh, te- technology can do that. Consulting to businesses, they love geopsychologists. Um, you know, I say going to the dark side, but it isn't. The uh, furniture businesses, uh, you know, what are good designs for um, um, working in with civil engineers for signage? Uh, you, architecture, gero architecture is, is remarkable. Um, so you can do anything, including. Uh, psychotherapy, but in the domain of clinical work, people are going to come out of our program stand with their doctorate, and they're going to be so precious because it's not a big field um, that they're going to be brought in and offered positions um, in companies and agencies and clinics, and go at a very high level very fast. Wonderful. So that. The onus is on us, and, and I'm revising it even as we speak to keep up with this so that they know how to do uh, supervision to multiple disciplines and, and consultation to different systems to uh, fit for, for in the service of older adults, to be able to evaluate access to care and what programs basically work. Okay, so that we're doing that for our students in addition to a good solid background as clinical psychologists. Well, so it's a real commitment as yes. far as the program is concerned. It nibbles away uh, at the electives. Right. Um, but, yeah. So you're, you're telling a story this morning sure. about uh, a true story. It is. About the great need mm-hmm. and about the wonderful opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm delighted that we've had this opportunity to talk, and I I thank you so very much. Most welcome, Stan. Thank you. For more information about the faculty members interviewed today and the topic of discussion, please follow these links.